Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and so many faces, period. <laughs> <clears throat> I've never been to Port Wainimi before. Probably some of you feel the same way. <laughs> But uh, I've been doing a lot of traveling recently. I was uh, in New York last weekend at the Open Center and in Prague two weeks before that. So this is the end of a long season of traveling. I'm not home yet, but at least I'm in my own time zone. I want to especially thank Andy Volk and the Carnegie Museum of Art in Oxnard for inviting me to participate. Uh, it represents a real commitment to uh, free speech and First Amendment rights, I think, for an art museum. Art museums have been taking some knocks recently, and so I think they doubly should be commended for their uh, courage. And I want to explain, as Andy mentioned, this is a benefit for Botanical Dimensions, which explains the double price over the ticket. All of this money will go to the preservation of uh, medicinal plants with a history of shamanic usage. That is the special focus of our botanical garden in Hawaii. And before I start the formal lecture, I'd like to just say a little bit about that. As you know, the rainforests of the world are being cleared at a very frightening rate. And uh, perhaps uh, voices are beginning to be heard to halt this destruction of the natural environment. But whether it's halted or not, the destruction of the knowledge of native peoples concerning the uses of the plants in the rainforest, this is disappearing without doubt in the next 30 years because these people are moving into cities, uh, taking jobs in the ordinary market economy, and thousands of years of accumulated folk medical knowledge is being lost. So the real world political work that Kat and I do is associated with botanical dimensions. We conceived it together many, many years ago, and then about six years ago, Kat took it over, put it on its official feet, made it a, a, a non-profit foundation, and has run it day to day since then uh, with tremendous energy and efficiency. So I'd like to acknowledge Kat McKenna here. My better half. In fact, my only good half. <laughs> And then I wanted to underscore what Andy said, a very special event two weeks from now at the Carnegie Museum. Roy Tuckman, Roy of Hollywood, bon vivant, countercultural figure, informational ferret of our time, <laughs> will be recast as an experimental composer of great uh, energy and imagination and I hope you'll all uh, turn out for Roy. He's been a wonderful force uh, in, in my life and I think in the cultural life of Southern California. Both Roy and Diane have done a wonderful job in raising the quality of public dialogue in Southern California, which I think is a precondition for any kind of uh, clear thinking about our future or our political situation. So, here's to Roy and Diane. Okay. 
Well, the theme that unites these lectures is uh, creativity and the techniques by which the artist can uh, refine his or her vision, expand the vision, communicate the vision. And um, before I get into that issue, I thought I would talk just a little bit about my notion of creativity per se. What is it uh, uh, in and of itself? And when I think like that, of course, I cast my mind back to nature. Nature is the great visible engine of creativity against which all other creative efforts uh, are measured. And creativity in nature has a curious uh, distribution. It's something which accumulates through time. If we stand back and look at the universe, we see that at its earliest moments, it was very simple. It was a plenum. It was without characters or characteristics. It was what in Hindu mythology is called the Turaya, which is described as attributeless. And naturally, if something is without attribution, you can't say much about it. It takes a while for it to undergo a declension into more creative realms. And these creative realms are distinguished as domains of difference. The precondition for creativity is, I think, disequilibrium, what mathematicians now call chaos. And through the life of the universe, as temperatures have fallen, more and more complex compound structures have arisen. And though there's been, um, you know, many a uh, slipping back in this process, over very large spans of time, we can say that creativity is conserved, that the universe becomes more creative, and out of that state of creative fecundity, more creativity is manifest. So that from that point of view, the universe is almost what we would have to call an art-making machine, an engine for the production of ever more novel forms of connectedness ever more exotic juxtapositions of disparate elements. And out of this, uh, I believe, arises implicitly a set of principles that we can then apply to uh, the human artist in the human world. N nature's creativity is obviously the wellspring of human creativity. We emerge out of nature almost, and this idea I think was fairly present close to the surface of the medieval mind, we emerge out of nature almost as its finest work of art. Uh, the, the medieval mind spoke of the productions of nature. This is a phrase you hear as late as the 18th century, the productions of nature. And human creativity uh, emerges out of that, whether you have a model of the Aristotelian um, great ladder of being or a more modern evolutionary view where we actually uh, consolidate emergent properties and somehow bring them to a focus of self-reflection. Now, I'm sure that we couldn't carry out a discussion of this sort without observing that the prototypic figure for the artist, as well as for the scientist, is the shaman. The shaman is the figure at the beginning of human history that unites 
the doctor, the scientist, and the artist into a single notion of caregiving and creativity. And I think that, you know, to whatever degree art over the past several centuries has wandered in the desert, it is because this shamanic function has been either suppressed or forgotten. And we've uh, different images of the artist have been held up at different times. Uh, the artist as uh, artisan, the artist as uh, handmaiden of a ruling class or family, the artist as designer for the production of integrated objects into a civilization. Uh, this notion of the artist as mystical journeyer, as one who goes into a world unseen by others and then returns to tell them of it, was pretty much lost in the post-medieval uh, and Renaissance conception of art up until the late 19th century or early 20th century, where, beginning with the Romantics, there is a new permission to explore the irrational. This really is the bridge back to the archaic shamanic function of the artist, permission to explore the irrational. The Romantics did it with their um, uh, elevation of titanic emotion, romantic love specifically. The symbolists in the mid-19th century did it by a uh, re-emphasis on the emotional content of the image and a rejection of the previous rationalism. And that emphasis on the image and on the emotion set the stage there for what I take to be the truly shamanic movements in art, which begin really with Alfred Jarry in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Jarry, you may remember, was the founder of something. understanding and I don't mean this 
um, in an intellectual sense. I mean it in the sense that Alfred North Whitehead intended when he defined understanding as the apperception of pattern as such. As such. There's nothing more to it than that. You see, if we were to look at this room and we were to squint our eyes and uh, I'm doing this right now and I see that the room divides itself into people dressed in red and people dressed in blue. This is a pattern and it tells me something about what I'm looking at. Now I shift my depth of field. Now I'm looking at where men are sitting and where women are sitting. This is a different pattern and it tells me more about what I am looking at. The number of these patterns theoretically present in any construction is infinite. That says to me then that the depth of understanding cannot be known. It cannot be known. Everything is imminent. William Blake makes this point, you know, that you can see infinity in a grain of sand. So understanding then is the, pre, the precondition for creativity. And this understanding is not so much intellectual as it is visual. Visual. And in thinking about this, I realized what an influence upon my own ideas in this area uh, Aldous Huxley was. Not the Huxley that we might ordinarily associate uh, with my concerns, the Huxley of the Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell, but the Huxley of a very modest book that he wrote in the early 50s called The Art of Seeing. The Art of Seeing. And in that book, he makes the point that a good art education begins with a good drawing hand. That to be able to coordinate the hand and eye and to see into nature, to see into the patterns present as such, is the precondition for a kind of approach to the absolute. Now out of this process of seeing, which I'm calling understanding, the creative process ushers in novelty. And many of you have heard me speak of novelty in another context, in the context of nature as a novelty producing engine of some sort and ourselves almost as the hand <clears throat> the handiwork of nature but this same handiwork of nature which we represent we also internalize and re-express through the novelty of the human world well now if we take seriously the, the shamanic model as a basis for authentic, authentic art, then certainly in the modern context, what we see missing from the repertoire of the artist are shamanic techniques. And it's for the discussion of these shamanic techniques, I believe, um, that I was brought here this evening. So I want you to cast your mind back to a great seminal moment, germinal moment in the history of human thought, which was about 25,000 years ago, the great glaciers that had covered most of the Eurasian land mass began to melt. And human populations that had been islanded from each other for about uh, 15 millennia began to recontact each other and reconnect. And out of this comes what is called the Magdalenian Revolution from 18,000.
20,000 to 22,000 years ago. And what it is, is nothing less than a tremendous explosion of creativity and aesthetic self-expression on the part of the human species. We find uh, the, for the first time, bone and antler technology takes its place along with stone technology. Musical instruments appear over a wide area and cave paintings, some paintings in areas and recesses so remote from the surface of the ground that it takes several hours to reach them, are painted and uh, set up in dramatic tableaus specifically designed to bring together sound, light, and dance in hierophanies, extravaganzas of aesthetic output that uh, invoke a kind of transcendent other that human beings for the first time are trying to come to grips with and make some kind of cultural statement about. And this pulling into matter of the ideas of human beings, first, you know, in the forms of uh, 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 beadwork and chipped stone and carved bone, within 20,000 years, ushers into the kinds of high civilizations that we see around us and points us toward the kind of extraplanetary mega civilization that we can feel operating on our own present like a kind of great attractor. Now, this whole intellectual adventure in exteriorization of ideas is entirely an aesthetic adventure. Until very uh, recently, utility is only a secondary consideration. The real notion is a kind of seizure by the tremendum, by the other, which then forces us to take up matter, clay, bone, flint, and put it through a mental process where we then excrete it as objects that have lodged within them ideas. This seems to be the special, unique, transcendental function of the human animal is the production and condensation of ideas. And what made it possible for the human animal is language. If you're seeking the thumbprint of the transcendental on the, on the uh, myriad phenomena that compose life on this planet, to my mind, the place to look is human language. Human language represents an ontological break of major magnitude with anything else going on on this planet. I mean, yes, bees dance and dolphins squeak and chimpanzees do what they do, but it's a hell of a step from there to uh, Wallace Stevens, let alone William Shakespeare. Uh, language is the unique province of human beings, and language is the unique tool of the artist. The artist is the person of language. And I've you know, given a lot of thought to this because uh, the work that I've done with psilocybin mushrooms and the observations of psychedelic plant use in the Amazon centered around ayahuasca lead me to the conclusion that it is the synergy and catalysis of language that lies behind not only the emergence of human consciousness out of animal organization, but then its ability to set a course for a transcendental dimension and pursue that course 
against all the vicissitudes of biology and history over 10 or 15,000 years. Language has made us more than a group of pack hunting monkeys. It's made us a group of pack hunting monkeys with a dream. cognitive activities, when we participate in them, we cross out of the domain of animal organization and into the domain of a genuine relationship to the transcendent. As you know, shamans in all times and places uh, gain their power through relationships with helping spirits which they sometimes call ancestors, sometimes call nature spirits, but somehow the acquisition of a relationship to a disincarnate intelligence is the precondition for authentic shamanism. Now, nowhere in our world do we have an institution like that that we do not consider pathological, except in the now very thinly spread tradition of the muse, that artists alone among human beings are given permission to talk in terms of my inspiration, or a voice which told me to do this, or uh, a vision that must be realized. The, the thin the thin line, the thin thread of shamanic descent into our profane world leads through the office of the artist. And so if society is to somehow take hold of itself at this penultimate moment as we literally waver on the brink of planetary extinction, then the artist, like Ariadne following her thread out of the labyrinth, is going to have to follow the shamanic thread back through time. And you know, one of the most disempowering things that has been done to us by the male dominant culture is to um, brush out our footprints into the past. We don't have a clue as to how we got here. Most people can't think further back than the first Nixon administration, <laughs> let alone, you know, uh, the arrival of the Vikings, the fall of Chitalhuyuk, the melting of the glaciers, so forth and so on. We have been disempowered by a rational tendency to deny our irrational roots, which are a kind of embarrassment to science because science is uh, the special province of the ego and magic and art are the special province of something else. I could name it, but I won't. It prefers to be unnamed, I think. So how seriously then are we to take this um, I'll call it an obligation to follow the shamanic thread back into time. Well, I, I think that it is uh, a matter of saving our own souls, that this is the real challenge. You know, 
I love to dig at the yogins by saying nobody ever went into an ashram with their knees knocking in fear over the tremendous dimension they know they were about to enter through meditation. Still truer and more sad, still more true and more sad, is the notion that very few of us pick up our sculpting tools or our airbrush with our knees knocking with fear because we know we are invoking and acting with the muse at our elbow. And somehow I think the artists need to recover this sense of uh, mystery. One of the most depressing things to me about the art scene, and I had a chance to reconnect with this because I was just in New York, is uh, it now has a kind of directionless quality. You can go into a gallery and you cannot tell whether it is 1990, 1980, 1970, or 1960, because a kind of eschatological malaise has settled over art. All notion of any forward movement toward a transcendental ideal has been put aside for um, the exploration of idiosyncratic vision. And I grant you, this is a, 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 a tension and perhaps in the question period we can talk about this. There is a tension between the individual vision and uh, the notion of an attractor or, or a, a collective vision which wants to be expressed. But to my mind, this is the same dichotomous tension that haunts the individual in his or her relationship to Tao. You know, we don't want to be lost in ego, but on the other hand, if we completely express the Tao, we have no sense of self. The ideal seems to be a kind of coincidentia positorum, a kind of literalizing of a paradox where what we have is Tao, but we perceive it as ego. And in the application of this notion to the art problem, I would say what we need is a situation where schooling, if you want to put it that way, or a tendency toward a coherent vision expressed by many artists is spontaneous. Each artist imagines that they are pursuing their own vision, yet obviously they are in the grip of an archetype which is rising through the medium of the unconscious. Now the last time we saw this in American art was in abstract expressionism, which was probably in terms of the values, in terms of tension and uh, the amount of uh, emotional gain between one artistic moment and another the break between abstract expressionism and what preceded it was the most radical break in American art in this century. Abstract expressionism actually carried us in to a confrontation with what the quantum physicists were telling us, that the universe is field upon field of integrated vibration, that there is no top level, there is no bottom level, that the ordinary structures of provisional space-time are simply that, that if we can rise out of the human dimension, then we discover these larger, more integrated dimensions where mind and nature somehow interpenetrate each other. A vision like that, a coherent vision, has yet to announce itself here in the uh, post-history, pre-apocalypse phase of things. Well, we can work this stuff out. I guess I have a, a kind of reactionary side 
um, when I think about the creative endeavor. I believe that um, we need each other. the psychedelic experience as encountered by each of you in the privacy of your own mind or as encountered by a pre-literate uh, society somewhere in the world that that psychedelic experience is in a way the Rosetta Stone not only for uh, understanding encryption that our own lives represent each to ourselves but it's also a Rosetta Stone for uncoding the historical experience art is this endeavor to leave the animal domain behind to create another dimension orthogonal to the concerns of uh, ordinary history and this orthogonal domain to my mind is glimpsed most clearly in the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience shows you more art in an hour and a half than the human species has produced in 15 or 20,000 years. Now, this is an incredible claim. This is why I make it. Uh, the, the energy barrier which separates us from this tremendous repository of transcendental imagery is very low. You know, it's a matter of a little personal commitment and uh, the substances which make the transition possible. The perturbation of brain chemistry is easily done. What is not so easily done is the assimilation of the consequences of this act. Uh, ordinarily, we assume that consciousness is channeled between tremendously deep walls, that there is no way to um, force uh, a confrontation with the other or the transcendent or the unconscious. We tend to assume that, you know, we're going to have to do double duty at the ashram for three decades before you're vouchsafed even a glimpse into these places. Uh, this is not true. Culture, and this is my message to artists and to anybody else who cares to notice, culture is a plot against the expansion of consciousness. And this plot prosecutes its, uh, its goals through a uh, limiting of language. Language is the battleground over which the, the fight will take place. Because what we, cannot, what we cannot say, we cannot communicate. And by say, I mean dance, paint, sing, mean. What we cannot say, we cannot communicate. We can conceive of things that we cannot communicate. But, and I think every one of us here has done that. And that's a thrilling thing. That is uh, the deep homework, the, the psychedelic inner astronaut sees things which no human being has ever seen before and no human being will ever see again. But in fact, this has no meaning unless it is possible to carry it back into the collectivity. And what motivates me to talk to groups like this is the belief that we do not have centuries of gently unfolding time ahead of us in which to uh, uh, you know, gently tease apart the threads of the human endeavor and create a bright new world. 
Uh, that's not our circumstance. Uh, this is a fire in a madhouse. And uh, to get a hold on the situation, I think we are going to have to force the issue. Well, uh, one, one way of forcing the issue or a, a chemical definition of forcing the issue when you're talking about a chemical reaction is catalysis. We want to catalyze consciousness. We want to move it faster toward its goals, whatever those goals are. Well, I believe that to the present moment, language, again in the broadest sense, speech, dance, musical composition, language has just been allowed to grow like topsy. It's uh, been a kind of uh, every man for himself situation. Now, what we really need as we see ourselves moving from one species among tens of thousands of species on this planet, over the past 10,000 years, we have redefined ourselves. And now, like it or not, we are the custodians of the destiny of this planet. Our decisions affect every life form on the planet. And yet, we are still communicating with each other with the extremely precise medium of small mouth noises mediated by ignorance and hate. <laughs> this doesn't seem like the way to do business as we approach the third millennium. So, it, it, what I... Uh, what I'm hopeful for, and what I actually see happening, I mean, I think that we're on the right track. The birth of a new kind of humanity is going to take place, but there are still a lot of decisions to be made. How violent shall this birth be? What toll shall it take upon our mother, the earth? What shape shall the baby be in when it finally is delivered? These are the decisions that artists can mediate and control. Most people are afraid of the unconscious. This is why, uh, you know, you can have a, a psychedelic compound like DMT, which is very much like ordinary brain chemistry, uh, appears completely physiologically harmless, uh, only lasts 10 minutes, extremely powerful and generally in this society you have no takers this is because there has been a failure of moral courage and the failure of moral courage is uh, perhaps most evident in our own community the community of uh, of the artists in a way uh, it's the poets that have failed us because they have not uh, provided a song or sung a vision that we could all move in concert to. So now we are in the absurd position of being able to do anything. And what we are doing is fouling our own nest and pushing ourselves toward planetary toxification and extinction. This is because the poets, the artists, have not articulated an, a, uh, a moral vision. The moral vision must come from the unconscious. It doesn't have to do, I believe, with uh, you know, these uh, post-meaning movements in art, deconstructionism and this sort of thing. I mean, I'm basically putting out a very conservative, but I think um, exciting program for art. That art's task is to save the soul of mankind. And that anything less is a dithering while Rome burns. Because if the artists who are self-selected for uh, being able to journey 
into the other. If the artist cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. Ideology is extremely alien to art. Political ideology, I mean. And if you will but notice, it is political ideology that has been calling the shots for the last seven or eight hundred years. We can transcend politics if we can put some other program in place. You cannot transcend politics into a void. And I believe that a world without ideology could be created if what were put in place of ideology were the notion of the realization of the good, the true, and the beautiful. You know, the three-tiered canon of the Platonic aesthetic. The reconnect, the notion of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Then, use psychedelics to empower the artist to go into this vast dimension that surrounds human history on all sides to an infinite depth and return from that world with the transcendental images that can lift us to a new cultural level. The muse is there. The, the dull maps that rationalism has given us are nothing more than whistling past the graveyard by the bad little boys of science. You only have to avail yourselves of these shamanic tools to rediscover a nature which is not mute, as Sartre said in a kind of culmination of the modern viewpoint. Nature is not mute. It is man who is deaf. And the way to open our ears, open our eyes, and reconnect with the intent of a living world is through the psychedelics. Now, as you know, biology runs on genes, and genes are the units of meaning of heredity. But we could make a model of the informational environment that is represented by culture. And in fact, this is done. A word has been invented, meme, M-E-M-E, -E, meme. A meme is not the smallest unit of heredity. A meme is the smallest unit of meaning, of an idea. Ideas are made of memes. And I think the art community might uh, function with more efficiency in the production of visionary aesthetic breakthroughs if we would think of ourselves as an environment modeled after the natural environment where we as artists are attempting to create means which enter an environment of other memes that are in competition with each other, and out of this competition of memes, ever more appropriate, adapted, and uh, suitable ideas can gather and uh, link themselves together into higher and higher organisms. Now, in order for this to happen, there is an obligation upon each one of us to carry our ideas clearly, because in the same way that a gene must be copied correctly to be replicated, or it will cause some pathological mutation, a meme must be correctly replicated, or it will cause a pathological mutation. For instance, I would say what the Nazis did to Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy was a bad cop, a miscopied meme became a toxic mutation inside a culture. So uh, I would suggest to the people in this room tonight that you take a good look around at who's here. Artistic people, psychedelic people, 
look pretty much like everybody else out in society. But we have come here tonight self-selected for our interest in the empowering capacity of psychedelic plants and the empowering capacity of art. So we represent an affinity group, a population with a potential for uh, uh, mutagenic impact on the ideological structures of the rest of society. So look around. Someone here has what you need. And if you can only figure out who it is, you can make a novel connection to move them into a new level of creativity. Well, what is this new level of uh, creativity? Some of you may be familiar with the theme that was very big in medieval religious art, which was uh, the apocalypse uh, of St. John or of somebody. There are a number of, of these apocalypses. And I think that uh, many of us may come out of a kind of secular background or have not given this kind of a religious idea too much consideration, but my uh, idiosyncratic conclusion based simply on trying to be honest about the content of the psychedelic experience is that uh, human history really is on a collision course with a uh, transcendental object of some sort. Uh, it is not going to be business as usual into the endless unfolding confines of the future. Uh, the very fact that human history is occurring on this planet, the very fact that a primate has left the ordinary pattern of primate activity and gone into the business of running stock markets and uh, molecular biology labs and art museums indicates to me the nearby presence in another dimension of a kind of hyper-organizing force or what I call the transcendental object. And I believe that this transcendental object is casting an enormous shadow over the human historical landscape. So that if you're back in uh, ancient Judea, you have an anticipation of the Messiah. If you are at Eleusis, at the height of the practice of the Eleusinian mysteries, you have an anticipation of uh, the dark God. These anticipations of an unspeakable transcendent reality that are always clothed in the, um, in the assumptions of the individual artist and the society in which he or she is working are in fact genuine. And that you don't have to give your yourself over to fundamentalist religion to connect with the fact that human history is an adventure. And this adventure has a number of startling reverses and sudden plot shifts that are very difficult to anticipate and that we are coming up on one of those. The civilization that was created out of the collapse of the medieval world has now shown its contradictions to be unbearable. And though no one of us knows what the shape of the new civilization will be, somehow in the singing of the ayahuasca songs in the rainforest, in the tremendous hypermetallic transcendental off-planetary flash of psilocybin, in the uh, 
teaching of the self-transforming machine elves that seem to dwell in the DMT dimension, we see that the ordinary linear expectations of history are breaking down and that uh, the, the truth of the eminence of the mystery is breaking through all the structures of denial of uh, the male dominator paradigm that has been in place so long. The way to make this birth process smooth, the way to bring it to a conclusion that will not betray the thousands and thousands of generations of people who, who suffered birth and disease and migration and starvation and lonely death so that we could sit here this evening, the redeeming of the human enterprise all lies then in helping this thing come to birth. And each artist is an antenna to the transcendental other. And as we go with our own history into that thing and then create a unique confluence of our uniqueness, and its uniqueness, we collectively create an arrow, an arrow out of history, out of time, perhaps even out of matter, that will redeem then the idea uh, that man is good, redeem the idea that man is good. This is the promise of art and its fulfillment is never more near than the present moment. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, I think we'll take a 